This is the Galerie Genes, an art gallery in San Mateo, California. It has the usual collection of watercolors, oils, and so on, but it also has these rather interesting pieces by an artist named Diane Fenster. What's special about these pieces is that they were done not using watercolors or oils, but using the pixels of a computer. Even the most traditional artists are now recognizing the computer as a legitimate medium of art. Today, we'll take a look at computers and art on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Intel, the world's leading manufacturer of microprocessors. Intel, the computer inside. Additional funding is provided by the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and with me today is Chelsea Samuel, an artist who works mostly on the Macintosh. And Chelsea, this is not quite a Mac. The platform here is the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, and this is the newest cartridge called Mario Paint. And it brings the kind of normal paint program you might find on a Mac or a PC to kids who have a Super Nintendo system. It has all the usual spray paint stuff and all that. It actually does more. I can go in here and not only paint that kind of background, but create an animation using uh, Mario Paint. There's my nine frames of animation. Put that on the background. I can also go in here and add music to my animation and to my background using a keyboard and a staff. It's a neat little artistic tool for kids. This is for kids. What you're doing is serious artwork on the Macintosh. And in fact, behind you is a painting you did just using the Mac. And I want you to explain to me how in the world you can do that. Well, this was quite a revelation for me to be able to paint the way that I would on canvas on the computer. Mm -hmm. uh, this was done in a software program that came out a few years ago. It was actually one of the first software programs to replicate natural media. And I painted by starting out large areas of color, filling in with, mm -hmm. with an oil brush, coming back in with detail over it, just like I would have on canvas. Now, recently, there have been quite a few innovations on, the, on computer software that allow me to take this quite a bit further. This was done in a software program called Painter. And what you see here is a watercolor wash where I started with a, I actually started with a pencil sketch, mm -hmm. the way that I would work on paper, put down some watercolor washes and came back in over it with chalk for a very natural look. It sure is. Okay, we're going to have you back later to explain more about how you do that. In fact, we'll see several computer artists at work today using Amigas, Macs, and PCs. We're going to begin, though, with a visit to the Academy of Art College in San Francisco where you can major in computer art. This is the Academy of Art College in San Francisco. So you scan these two in, you scan in the clock, lift it off. This is one of the few art schools in the country where you can major in computer art. The curriculum consists of courses like computerized paint systems, desktop design, and electronic photography. The school teaches on the Macintosh and uses software like Fractal Design Painter and Adobe Photoshop. The computer photography class is taught by Paul Klein. He used to be a traditional commercial photographer, but then the computer came along. I watched through the early 80s the ability of the computer to digitize the same information that I was working with traditionally. And I uh, became very, very attracted to it and very excited by it. So I proceeded to uh, try some explorations with some of my own imagery, both commercial and art-oriented, and uh, be, uh, found out what I could do electronically with uh, various uh, photo enhancement programs would take three or four days in the darkroom to complete. Klein says despite the abundance of high-powered Macs, this is, after all, just an art class. There's no need for students to be intimidated by the technology, though some of the students are reluctant to cross that high-tech barrier. They can't break the computer, and they shouldn't worry about that. And also, uh, they're free. They're in a school environment here where they should explore and experiment with all the possibilities. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Jonelle Patterson. I've been able to do that with this tablet. I can also, for instance, do things like turn the image upside down, or I The Amiga has always been a great creative platform for music, for video, and for art. 
Here to show us some whiz-bang art software on the new Amiga 4000 is John Seavers of Centaur Development. Also with us, Greg Gorby, the creator of Aladdin 4D. John, let's start with Opal Vision, which is hardware and software. It comes with a board. And show us what's on the board there, John. All right. This is the Opal Vision main board. It increases the graphics capabilities of the Amiga computer and gives you 24-bit color, 16 million colors per pixel. Uh -huh. You notice the board has expansion connectors on it where you can connect a scan rate converter, a frame grabber genlock module, uh -huh. Uh, and this socket's for a video special effects, mm -hmm. effects chip, which gives you wonderful video effects. There's also an external production switch which connects to the huh. board. All right, let's turn to the software which you have okay. up here on the Amiga and show us a little bit about what you can do with Opal Vision. All right, this is Opal Paint, the uh, painting package that comes with it. It's a very artist-friendly program. Uh, for example, this is the palette requester. You can move around the color wheel here. Uh, you can take individual colors and put them down over here in this section. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I've done that, I can stir them together just as if they were wet paint. Mm -hmm. I think you can see that. Or put a wash over the top of them. So it's like adding water, water on it, yeah. Um, you can also load palettes that have been pre-saved on disk. Here's a series of palettes. You just double click on them. That's nice because you don't have to remember file names. Mm -hmm. You know, artists can are visually oriented right. people, so they would just click on that and select that palette. Mm. Um, I've preloaded a series of screens here, and I can flip through them. In addition to normal modes like drawing, you know, circles and lines, uh, there are other modes available, uh, really uh, <coughs> quite a variety of them, about 50, like this is an emboss mode, mm -hmm. so we can select that. Okay, th this is a scanned in image which you put into the machine Correct. and now you are manipulating it Correct. and playing with it. Uh -huh. So there's an emboss uh -huh. effect. I can undo that, go back into my modes menu and select the edge and just hit the A key on the keyboard to do it again. Now it finds all the edges in the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, the next screen is uh, here so that I can show you that you can actually grab a brush. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Grab a brush, and I'll put it back down on the screen, but this time I'm applying a paper type to it. You notice there's a, a very subtle sort of So you can effect. pick up the image and apply it on a different background paper. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll load another one so you can get a better example of that. Here's a a tile paper effect. I'll increase the depth a little bit and pick up that same brush and put it down. Mm -hmm. And on the next screen, um, there's a series of those that have already mm -hmm. been done. Again, this was preloaded. There's different paper right. types down here at the bottom. Here's the emboss tool we used earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that's often difficult to do in 24 painting programs is to uh, isolate an area of colors uh, but we have an easy way to do that. You can set uh, tolerances for hue, saturation, uh -huh. and value. Again, I preset these in the interest of time. And uh, pick out a color here. And now it just tints just and that, that green portion of the that, screen. Yeah. Right. Try it again with a different color. Let's see it again. Mm -hmm. uh, another mode that's available, you notice I smeared those colors in the right. palette before. I can also do that with multiple colors. I can smear and give kind of a painterly effect. So again, you're taking that scanned image, you're, you're sort right. of turning it into something that looks like a painting right. instead. Though, huh? If you look at the next screen, uh -huh. that's what, that would be like if you yeah. applied it to the wow. entire image. What um, else can you do with <coughs> Opal Vision? Well, it also does real-time uh, animations mm -hmm. in 24-bit. I've preloaded this animation. Wow. This was done in a 3D rendering program, and you can see that you can actually play animations through the board in 16 million yeah. colors in real time. Huh. All right, Greg, let's turn to Aladdin 4D now. And I guess, as the name suggests, we're moving into three-dimensional artwork now, right? That's right. Unlike the uh, two-dimensional programs, you have a full three dimensions to work in. Um, you have your X, Y, and your Z right. axis. How, how do you do deal with 3D on a 2D screen here? Well, as you're looking here, this is a main window into the program. Uh, you can see your X and Y and mm -hmm. your Z axes rotating here slowly in space. Um, I'm going to flatten out the view uh, to draw. You draw in the program in uh, multi-sided polygons like so, they can have any number of points. Uh, we can do things after you've drawn basic polygons, like for instance, I'll extrude this into a 3D form. Let's rotate it a little bit uh -huh. and show you what it looks like. Um, that helps you to clarify what you've done. I'm going to center this to the image, to the center, the origin of the uh, axis system mm -hmm. in the program. And uh, let's find it back out again. One of the more exciting things is its animation capabilities. So I'm going to draw another polygon here, which will uh, turn into a path for the extrusion to follow. And of course, you can draw that in any shape or form that you want. Let's group these. We're going to select this and uh, turn it into a, uh, a path. 
the complexity of the uh, requester here shows you, gives you mm -hmm. some hint about the amount of power available in the program. Right now we're going to ask it to go ahead and uh, follow along that path and to rotate 360 degrees around the z-axis halfway through the animation. And then we're going to ask it, the program to preview that in, uh, let's say, 240 frames, which would be about uh, 8 seconds on video here. And, uh, and nothing happens, and that's, of course, because I forgot to uh, <laughs> tell it that this should be looking at this right. path during the animation. So uh -huh. now you can so see that it's it'll following that path you created. Right. And halfway through, it'll begin its rotation and so on. You can do other things, like, for instance, if we altered this path in some manner, I'm going to move it like so and add a couple more points, and uh, it'll adapt to those changes very readily mm -hmm. for you. So. Uh, it's also an interactive preview, so you can zoom out or zoom in in real time. You can change your view angle, so we're going to look down from the uh -huh. top. And you can increase your wide angle effects and so on. But let's go back here. Um, in, uh, there are multiple spaces available in the program. We're in space two at this time. In space one, I've got an object that I had preloaded, and uh, rendering time is very important to a lot of users of 3D software. So although I'm not going to complete this image, I just wanted to give you a That's feel. That's that star-shaped object you just pulled up in that other space. That's right. Uh, the background here is a digitized image that was brought in through a video camera of a, of a rock. Um, and that's a pretty quick rendering. Then. Very quick uh, for uh, 3D software. Okay, what else can we do briefly? Well, okay, let's go back to the editor here. I'm going to uh, create a new space here. Uh, the other objects that we were working with are still available if we wanted mm -hmm. to. But we'll go ahead and work in the new space. I'll draw another very simple freehand polygon here. I'm going to uh, move it away from the origin and uh, select the z-axis and tell it that we want to sweep 36 segments and 360 mm -hmm. degrees around the z-axis and go ahead and sweep this wow. form. So you can see that the feedback on the program is very quick. Um, the, the important concept here for us is that uh, long feedback times, long rendering times and so on interfere with the user's creativity. Mm -hmm. And so we've done our best to optimize this as much as possible for that. If we were to uh, preview an animation of this, um, let's say at the 240 frames as we did before, let's go ahead and uh, this time ask it to rotate the entire world 360 degrees instead of making a path. Yeah. You can see the feed feedback time is slower, so we've incorporated different display right. modes to allow Greg, you... Greg, the point in all this, I guess, would be to creating uh, like a 3D uh, logo or graphic image for television. We have a video of some of the finished work. If we can roll the video right now and tell us what we're seeing as we take a look at that, Greg. Okay. Uh, you're looking at um, a chrome faucet dripping with some water effects on a flat polygon surface. These are some donuts with bump maps and textures applied. Mm -hmm. um, just different images. Now, these were all put out to a single frame recorder through uh, different hardware, for instance, Firecracker, DC, DC TV and yeah. Opal Vision for the Amiga. Um, the, uh, the results that you're seeing here are good enough for broadcast, but they're also used an awful lot for in-house industrial uses and educational purposes at small yeah. universities and so on. All right, great stuff, Greg. Thank you very much. And also you, John, for showing us Opal Vision. The Macintosh is also a popular platform for creative artists who use the Mac not only to create the usual kind of visual arts, but who use the power of the computer to create what is called interactive art. One such artist is Jim Lutke of San Francisco. So in this world, you can also click, and this is the beginning of the, you know, being able to explore. Jim Lutke like used to be an airbrush illustrator for magazines. When the Macintosh first came out, he thought it was just a toy. But as its graphics power expanded and three-dimensional software okay. became available, he became a convert to computer art. As 3D programs got oh, yeah. better and gave more control to the user as far as surface, um, you know, light positions, reflectivity of, of objects and things like that, and the ease of modeling, it became, it started to feel more like a world that you're manipulating, like someone might manipulate a, a movie set if they had it all in front of them. This is one of Lutke's interactive computer art creations, The Freak Show. With the work that I'm doing now in Freak Show, I'm trying deliberately to create a, a sense of mood and a sense of place and time and uh, characters exist within specific worlds. And I want that world to reflect a type of a personality or, or a type of a character rather than the exciting things that a tool can do. 
The process starts with a sketch of characters, then they're built into 3D models. But the real creativity becomes evident once the artist starts playing with the characters in their environment. One thing that I think is really important to have in this kind of work is a really fast renderer. And that's, that's one reason I use electric image, it's very quick. This artist's work ranges from the far out to the commercial, like these animated graphics for the Nickelodeon cable channel. Lutke says the computer has opened up a whole new world of creativity, which in some ways is better than the real world. I found some of the, the tools that are arriving only now on the Mac are very stimulating to creativity, that they're, they're actually allowing you to do more than you could do in the physical world. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Jonelle Patterson. So what if you own an IBM compatible? Can you do computer art too? Well, these days you can using powerful and creative software like CorelDRAW and Painter from Fractal Design. Here to show us both programs are Robert Lenve of Corel Corporation and back with us, Chelsea Samuel, a freelance artist and illustrator. Robert, let's turn to uh, the Windows version you have here, which is, which is CorelDRAW, right. and show us what you can do here uh, on a PC compatible. Okay, well, CorelDRAW is really a complete business graphics toolkit. And we're going to focus on the vector side of CorelDRAW first, which is uh, CorelDRAW itself. Now, wait a minute. But when you say vector side, what do you mean? What vector means is that we work with smooth lines and curves as opposed to just pixels. Okay. So that when you stretch them, they stay, uh, they stay smooth and they can be scaled to virtually any size. So let me just put some text here, up here on the screen. I'm going to show you a couple of program special effects. We'll start by applying a little bit of color here. And we've got four powerful effects, including enveloping, which allows me to take a piece of text and stretch it like it's silly putty. Mm. And we can always just clear that. And we can even apply a, a, a perspective. And I'm just going to select the two control points here and stretch that and we can simulate the perspective and this is my vanishing point which I can move around mm -hmm. on the page very quickly and easily. Again, we'll just clear that and we'll go and we'll simulate 3D with this. And What we'll do is we'll get one of our uh, new roll-ups. These are roll-up windows that actually roll up and down right here on the interface mm -hmm. and what we'll do is uh, we'll turn a light source on so we can actually simulate rendering like you might see in a high-end CAD program and we'll just go ahead and apply that and the the program will draw the, the, uh, the text with the 3D look and the appropriate shading all in place. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. Now we can even go and rotate that in, uh, in full 3D space, both along the X, Y, and the Z axes. Mm -hmm. Now that's just uh, a couple of the special effects that the program can do. I'm going to show you now Corel Photo Paint, which is again one of the uh, four complete graphic applications that come with Corel Draw and Photo Paint is a full photo retouching and bitmap program. Mm -hmm. So we also take care of the bitmap side of graphics as well. And what I'm going to do is take a file here that we scanned in a little bit earlier. It's a color tip file and we support 24-bit color. And we have all the basic tools that you need for image editing. We can take the image, for example, and flip it horizontally. We can zoom in, let's say here on his teeth and we can apply some of the filters. Let's say, for example, we decide that the teeth aren't white enough, we can get uh, one of the sharpening filters and actually brighten up the teeth like mm. that very quickly and easily. Let's zoom back. The, uh, the photograph was taken against a white background. What we can do is actually go and get a tile pattern. Uh, we include a large library of tiles here with the program. Uh, these are in PCX format. We'll just get our tile rollout. We simply uh, double-click on the background and the program automatically fills mm -hmm. in the image for you. And we also have in the program two other modules, one for business graphics mm. and for That's presentations. Great. All right, now I want to turn to you again, Chelsea. And now Painter, which you're going to use, also runs under Windows, but you're going to be showing on a Macintosh. You work on the Mac platform. Yes. Show us, I want to see how you actually got to the point in those great paintings you showed us at the beginning of the program using, using Painter. Okay, well, to begin with in uh, Painter, what I would normally do is just grab a pencil and just begin sketching. And you'll notice as I sketch, that it is replicating natural media very beautifully. It sure is. It's bringing through a paper texture. It's pressure sensitive, so you're seeing the, the human gesture there. You can see a lot of subtlety as I draw. Mm -hmm. I can get darker lines just by pressing harder. And now, I'll, usually I would start this way. I would start with just a pencil sketch, and now I'll start adding some color into it. I can set my paint to be wet, 
And this might seem sort of obvious to someone, but if you've ever worked with watercolor, you know that it's a very difficult medium to control. Yeah. You're not out at 3 a.m. with your blow dryer trying to get your uh, painting <laughs> finished anymore. This is a real boon to artists. Gives you a mm. lot of control over the image. We'll put a little bit of a, a bruise on the pair here and add some highlights. I can re remove the density of the paint as well as I draw just by floating in some clear water. And we'll end by a quick drop shadow here. Notice the paper texture also. Yeah. The pigment of the paint is depositing more heavily in the valleys of the paper. So that would be a way that I would just very quickly begin something. That's and gorgeous. That's just real-time boom. You did it, huh? Bo real-time boom. You didn't mess up the kitchen table or anything. <laughs> That's right. No muss, no fuss art. Yeah. Uh, this is something that I was working on earlier. This is a sketch of some apples. And this particular one I did in the colored pencils. To continue it, I might come and grab something like a, a pastel chalk and maybe add some highlights into the apple here. Mm -hmm. And again, you can see that the not only is the paper texture coming through as I draw, but I can get very subtle lines to very, very dense dark lines depending on how hard I press. So it's really feeling, it's working interactively with the artist mm -hmm. and allowing the the artist's personal expression to come through. Um, obviously, I've shown ways that an artist would begin something, but there are so many very powerful tools just in the machinery itself, for instance. I can meld two images together very quickly. I've got a background that I created, just a very quick sketch of, a, of an ocean scene that I did, again, using the pastel chalks. And now I'm going to meld these two images together. So you did the chair as a separate piece of art. Right. And you can meld that into, into a background you created earlier. This is something that I'm doing very quickly that on paper yeah. would just take oh. hours and hours and hours. So you can see with the, the combination for an artist of being able to reproduce the look and feel of natural media combined with the, the high-tech medium mm -hmm. of, of the computer, you just have a, a very, very powerful tool for fine artists. What, what are the, uh, are there trade-offs though? I mean, you, uh, we're talking about emulating the, the environment in which you would really be using paint or really be using a pencil, but I mean, mm -hmm. I, I take it there's some advantage to not really using paint or not using a pencil. Well, certainly there are. You've got the machinery itself, uh -huh. which allows me to archive my images, send them halfway across the country. I can create a sketch like this, modem it to an art director and have approval on a sketch yeah, within yeah, 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, and the, the other thing is that I, I have a lot of creativity within the machinery itself where I can try different images like this. Mm -hmm. like and what do you do for hard copy, like the, like the painting you show us frame, you showed us in a frame at the beginning of the program. Now, what do you use to turn this into a, something you can hang on your wall? Uh, I think that's actually a question that a lot of artists have been wrestling with. I have been experimenting with different printers, such as the iris printer mm -hmm. and the Kodak. The dye sublimation printers are very nice. But are you satisfied with, with the texture and the look when you finally get it off the screen and onto a piece of paper? There are new printers, I mentioned the iris, that can actually print out onto watercolor paper yeah. and canvas, which is taking it to that extra step. Okay, very impressive. Thank you both very much. That is our look at computers and art. Stay tuned now for this week's Computer News on Random Access. In the random access file this week, Apple has announced two new PowerBook models. The 180C will bring active matrix color to the PowerBook line. The new 145B is an entry-level PowerBook priced about 25% lower than the Model 170. Zenith has introduced a pen-top version of its Zenote Portable. It's a 486 machine with a 120 megabyte hard drive and built-in Ethernet hardware. If you want portability and multimedia, Micro Express has unveiled its new Regal Portable. The lunchbox-style PC is a 33 MHz 486 with a built-in sound blaster card, CD-ROM drive, stereo speakers, and a 200 MB hard drive. Two new wireless modems announced this week. Motorola is promising a PC MCIA format modem with built-in battery and antenna, and Intel says it will be out later this year with a wireless modem that comes bundled with AT&T communications software. Time now for this week's software review from Paul Schindler of Windows Magazine, provided courtesy of CMP Publications. Today, we'll look at an intelligent atlas for Windows called AutoMap. Plan your routes and determine distances at home. You may never need AAA again, at least not for trip ticks. You begin with a map of the United States. For more detail, push the plus button. For less, push the minus button. 
Under Route Menu, Set Journey Preferences, you'll find an interesting feature, Slider Bar Preference Setters, that enable you to decide what kind of roads you want to travel and even whether you like ferries or not. If you give ferries a strong preference, it'll route you out of your way to ride on one. You take the green flag and set your starting point, the checkered flag and set your ending point, then push Calculate and tell AutoMap whether you want the shortest, fastest, or alternate route. It then offers you detailed directions which you can print or save. These really are directions good enough to drive with. Of course, you can also just play with the map using the zoom in and zoom out controls. AutoMap is $100 from AutoMap Incorporated in Phoenix, Arizona. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. In other software news, Intuit has announced Quicken 4.0 for the Macintosh, and Quarterdeck is shipping version 7 of its expanded memory manager, which it says offers significant gains in the amount of memory it can open up. The U.S. House of Representatives has announced a standard email system for members and constituents using technology from SoftSwitch. And finally, if you're looking for a book to teach your children about computer basics, the Dream Factory has come out with Teaching an Old Cat New Tricks, a colorful guide to computer literacy. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Janelle Stelson. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Intel, the world's leading manufacturer of microprocessors. Intel, the computer inside. Additional funding is provided by the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy.